I've just written up a theorem so that I didn't have to waste my time, you know, writing it out because I've mentioned the theorem already. We're not going to prove it now. It's an exercise in the notes. So you should go and do it. You've got all the ingredients now to do it. If you have a function f in LP and you look at the martingale associated with that, it converges almost everywhere point-wise, not necessarily to the original function, but to the conditional expectation on the limiting sigma algebra of that function. And the ingredients are, as I said last time, the convergence on a nice dense subspace, the functions that are already in one of the sigma algebras in the filtration, so that then the limit is actually a stationary limit and there's nothing to show. And you use the dude maximal theorem to bootstrap that up to the full space using this Banach convergence principle. And if you can't work out the proof of that, you, you Google the Banach convergence principle and you find a similar proof, maybe for a different property and you generalize that. Or you just find the proof itself and you copy it out and you still learn if you do that. Okay. A couple of people are unmuted. I'll mute you all. Very good. Of course you can unmute yourself if you want to. So what are we gonna look at now? We're gonna look at a converse question, which is where it gets more interesting because up until now it's all been very scalar valued and that's, that's interesting, but this isn't a course about scalar valued analysis. The converse question is which X valued martingales F bullet uh, of the form Fn is conditional expectation of some function F for some F. Which martingales are dupe martingales using the terminology of dupe martingales? You can also ask the question, which is actually the same question. Basically, which martingales f bullet have almost everywhere point-wise limits? So we know the martingales of the above form, martingales of this form, they have almost everywhere limits as long as the function f's in LP for some p greater than or equal to one. I want to emphasize here, one is allowed here in this interval. If your martingale does have an almost everywhere point-wise limit, call it F, then a small argument will show that the conditional expectations of that F give you the martingale you started with. So these are kind of the same question. I don't know about the minimal assumptions you need to make all of that work and, and I'm frankly not too interested in those minimal assumptions, but this is a motivating question. Starting with a general martingale, can you actually see it as the martingale coming from a fixed function? It turns out a lot of the time you can, and we'll get to that. We start as always with the definition. We take a P between one and infinity. I don't know, uh, we do want to include infinity this time. An X valued stochastic process F bullet on a probability space omega is called LP bounded. If the supremum over N of the LP norm of FN is finite. So you have a uniform LP bound on all of the elements of the process. Some people actually give this thing a name. They'll call it the LP norm of the process. Uh, I won't, but maybe I should have. This is a natural norm on a, on a stochastic process, the kind of LP norm of the process. There's a few more aspects to this definition because something funny happens at L1. Funny things always happen at L1. A bounded subset F of L1 omega, and this is the scalar L1 space here, a bounded subset, subset of L1. I will emphasize scalar. 
is called uniformly integrable. or sometimes equi-integrable. If, now here come the epsilons and the deltas, for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists delta greater than zero, such that for all sets A in the sigma algebra A, if the probability of A is smaller than delta, so if you take a small enough set, then you have a uniform integrability condition. That's why it's called uniform, uniformly integrable. Supremum of f over f in the set of the integral over a of the absolute value of f is less than epsilon. And it's worth just meditating on that condition for a second just to get a feel for what that really means. It means that integrating over A here, of course, you can make the integral of any of the functions in the set F as small as you like by restricting, pure, by purely by restricting to a small enough set. And this set doesn't have to have anything to do with the functions. Because of course, if you have an L1 function F and a threshold epsilon, if you take a small enough measure set, the integral over that set will be less than epsilon. But choosing this set, this set will depend on f, on this, the function f in general. This condition says that you can actually choose your sets uniformly over all of the functions in your set. Okay, that's uniform integrability of a set. And the final part of the definition is that the x valued process f bullet from above is called uniformly integrable. If the set of norms, of norm functions, uh, if this set here is contained in L1, if this set is uniformly integrable, And I forgot a condition here, not just any process, but an L1 bounded process we need. Because I've only defined uniform integrability for bounded sets in L1. So what we'd like is we take a, an X valued process, which is L1 bounded, and we add the additional condition of uniform integrability. And we're always gonna need to add this condition when we consider things in L1, because L1's not good. L1's a bad space. You always need extra conditions to make things work. There's a good reason for these conditions. I mean, it's not just like our uniform integrability is just what works. There's actually a deeper reason for this. It's a theorem, which I didn't prove. It's in the notes. I didn't even prove it in the notes. I just made a reference to, to a proof in the notes. Uh, a subset of L1 is uniformly integrable if and only if it is weakly, oops, I should write weakly properly, weakly relatively compact. Which is important. We've got this whole business of weak topologies in Barnard spaces. We know that bounded sets in Barnard spaces are generally not compact because the spaces are generally infinite dimensional. But sometimes you have weak compactness, compactness in the weak topology. And this is often enough. And in L1, if you want to guarantee weak relative, if you want the closure to be compact in the weak topology, the condition you need is exactly uniform integrability. Uh, let me just give a little bit more discussion of these functional analytic results before we, these, these are kind of assumed results, but I'm also assuming that you've all forgotten them because I had also forgotten them when I was writing these notes. Let's give you a couple of theorems, which are all in the appendix of the notes. Am I spelling this name right? No, I'm not. 
Sorry, sorry, Ebelon. Ebelon Smolian theorem says that for a subset A of a Banach space X, the following are equivalent. Uh, weak compactness. This is equivalent to weak sequential compactness. I'll remind you what these all mean. This is also equivalent to weak countable compactness. And yeah, I, I assume you've probably forgotten the exact definitions of these three different compactness notions. Compactness, compactness is every open cover has a finite subcover. You probably remember that one. This is classical compactness in a topological space. Of course, all of these are in the weak topology. Compactness is every open cover has a finite subcover. Sequential compactness is that every sequence has a convergent subsequence. And countable compactness is that every countable open cover has a finite subcover. Or equivalently, that every sequence has a cluster point. Now we don't really need to remember all of these equivalent characterizations, but the one we probably need to remember is the one for compactness, because this is the definition of compactness, and sequential compactness. Every sequence has a convergent subsequence. And your intuition is probably telling you, hang on, all these things are equivalent. That's for metric spaces. <laughs> In metric spaces, these three notions are equivalent. Now the weak topology on a Banach space is not metrizable most of the time. <laughs> so you don't have these equivalences in general, but the ebline smolian theorem tells you that the weak topology on a bounded set of a Banach space behaves like a metrizable topology from the viewpoint of compactness. So you, may, you can pretend you're in a metrizable space essentially. And another theorem which will behave well with this, which is a consequence of the Banach Alaugu, don't know how to pronounce that, theorem, which is also in the appendix of the notes, is that a Banach space X is reflexive if and only if the closed unit ball called B sub X closed is weakly compact. So you can combine that with the previous theorem and say, okay, if we're in a reflexive space and a closed unit ball is weakly compact, which also means it's weakly sequentially compact by the previous theorem, right? So all of this is to say in a very roundabout way, For P between one and infinity, not including one, not including infinity, every bounded subset F in LP scalar has a weakly convergent subsequence. <laughs> That's what I wanted to get at because LP is reflexive when P is greater than one. And Banakalauglu will tell you that any closed set, any closed bounded subset is weakly compact, or any bounded subset is weakly relatively compact, passing to the closure. Then Eberlein Smolin will tell you that that's equivalent to the weak sequential compactness of that closure, which means that every bounded subset has a weakly convergent subsequence. And now, from what I said before, from this theorem up here in the notes, what happens for p greater than one? Every uniformly integrable and bounded subset F in L1 
has a weekly convergent. Sorry for the handwriting, it's getting distinctly worse here. Subsequence. Sorry, what do we mean by the subse by subsequence of a set? Sequence. Ah, okay, so uh, <laughs> subset means sequence here. Sequence, okay. yes. Then. Of course. <laughs> There's synonyms, yeah. <laughs> sets of sequences. I'm, all of the sets I'm going to consider are actually going to be sequences. They're going to be martingales. You can sort of see what's going to happen here. We're going to take an LP bounded or L1 bounded uniformly integral martingale. And we're going to use this to extract a weekly conversion subsequence. That's what the following proof is going to be. Yeah. I'm going to hide sequence, sequence. And I'm going to fix that in the notes if it's wrong in the notes. but. My handwritten notes are wrong more often than my type notes are because I spent more time on the type notes. Let's see. So let's go to a theorem and we already have most of the proof. Given the probability space, given P between one and infinity. I'm not including infinity here and I'm not sure why do I, is this truly false for infinity? No, I think I'm not including infinity for good reason here. Let's not include infinity. And let's take F dot to be an LP bounded martingale, a scalar valued too. So let's say scalar valued martingale with respect to a filtration A dot. I didn't quantify over a dot, it doesn't matter. And if P is one, we assume in addition that the martingale is uniformly integrable. Then there exists a function F, or we'll call it F infinity, which is an LP and it's a measurable. In general, it's going to be measurable with respect to a limiting sigma algebra, but it is still a measurable. So it exists at F infinity such that Fn is the conditional expectation of F infinity for all n, which is one thing we'd like to show, but in the scalar valued case. And in particular, we know that Fn goes to F infinity point-wise almost everywhere because we already proved that as a consequence of the Dube. Well, we didn't prove it. I told you to prove it as a consequence of the Dube maximal theorem. And hence F dot has an almost everywhere limit. I mean, we know that almost everywhere limits also in LP. We know more than this, but the important thing kind of is that the martingale actually has a pointwise limit. That's more fundamentally important than this function existing because it, it will imply that in the end. And we already have most of the proof because of that whole functional analytic discussion back there about weak relative compactness and so on. Uh, by the discussion above, The sequence Fn has a weakly convergent subsequence. F sub n sub k. Let's uh, call the limit F infinity, of course. And this F infinity is in LP because that's how weak convergence works. It's got to converge to something, right? That something has to be in the space because that's what, uh, yeah. That's what weak convergence means in a Barnack space. It converges to something in that Barnack space, right? It's a bit tautological, yeah. So we just need to check that this F infinity has the properties that we say it has. So let's fix an N in the natural numbers and let's fix a set A in the sigma algebra AN. 
if we integrate f infinity over a, we're trying to show that the conditional expectation of f infinity is fn here. This is just the function f infinity paired against the characteristic function of a, thinking of the duality pairing between LP and LP prime. And by the weak convergence, this is the definition of weak convergence. This is the limit as k goes to infinity of f n k integrated against a characteristic function. This is weak convergence. It's convergence when you test against linear functionals, in particular, when you test against this linear functional characteristic function of A, you have convergence. Now this is the limit as k goes to infinity of the integral of f and k over A. We're not done yet. If k is so large, it doesn't have to be so large, if k is large enough that n sub k is greater than n, in particular, if k is greater than n, this will be true because of how subsequences work. Your integral of f n k over a will be the integral of the, of the conditional expectation with respect to a n of f n k because a is in the sigma algebra a n and using the defining property of conditional expectation. And since nk is greater than or equal to n, the Martingale property of f, I should say f is a Martingale, f dot is a Martingale. This conditional expectation here will just be fn. And this right hand side here is k independent, which is good for us. So what this tells you is that the integral over a of f infinity is the limit as k goes to infinity of the integral of f n k. But when k is large enough, this is just the integral of f n using that a is in the sigma algebra a n. And what does this tell you? This tells you that f n is the conditional expectation with respect to a n of f infinity using the defining property and uniqueness of conditional expectations almost everywhere. So let me write AE here just to emphasize that's almost everywhere equality. And that was our goal. So the proof is done. Nice and simple. It's just straight functional analysis and properties of conditional expectations. Very good. But unfortunately that was all scalar value. <laughs> Right, so that's not really the goal of, of this course to prove scalar valued results, but we do need to prove first the scalar ones. And if I assumed everybody knew probability in the stochastic processes already, I would have skipped this whole part of the course, but not everybody knows that, so I have to go through these proofs. Yeah, so let's move to Barnack spaces finally and do something that's more legitimately interesting from the Barnack perspective. Were there any questions about that proof? Anyone uncertain about things? I just realized I'm kind of relying on looking just at people shaking their heads and so on. Oh, Tim's saying something. Yeah, just a notational question. So you've got this bracket notation here, uh, indicator of A applied to F. This one? That's not the same thing as applying a functional. Like oh, that's what I mean. Yeah, applying so the functional, I should really write like, phi of this, where phi is this map that associates functions with functionals in this whole duality pairing business. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, okay. I'm just freely identifying these things. If I wanted to be really pedantic, that's what I'd have to write. Right, okay. Where phi is mapping LP prime of omega into LP of omega. Dual. But it's a shorthand, okay. All right, that is- I just wanted to emphasize that we have weak convergence and I wanted to write it as pairing against a functional and then taking the limit. That's so to fine. directly use that definition. Yeah, Thanks. as I was just saying before, I'm sort of relying on seeing people shaking their heads to mean that they don't have questions. But I also realize that I can't see everybody's screens at once. I can only see like nine people and the whole second page I'm not seeing. And nobody knows whether they're on my second page or not. <laughs> it goes basically in order of who came in first. So like, I see Tim, I see Nick, 
I see Calvin, I see Leonard, I see other people. But whoever's at the end, Aiden, Sebastian, I can't see your screens. So you, so you have to speak up if you have a question. Otherwise, I won't know. But I assume you'll shout out if you have a question anyway. So that's, that's all right. Feel free to do that. So what was I saying? Barnack spaces. Let's move on and let's make a definition because I really like making definitions. Let's take a P between one and infinity. We say that a Banach space X has the following property. We'll call it the P Martingale convergence property. And we'll abbreviate that to P MCP. If every X valued LP bounded Martingale and we also add uniform integrability if P equals one Every LP, every LP bounded X valued martingale has to converge almost everywhere to some limit. We'll call out the P martingale convergence property of a Banach space. And the fact that I've defined it in this way immediately tells you that not every Banach space satisfies it. Although I haven't proven that yet. We'll make a little sub definition. We'll say that X has this property PMCP with respect to a fixed probability space. If the property above holds for all martingales on that space. I don't really care what choice of filtration we have, but sometimes the underlying, for example, if the probability space is finite, if you only have finitely many points, or I say, if you only have one point, <laughs> then this property automatically holds. When we start to take larger probability spaces, it starts to become a stricter condition and it starts to eventually fail for some spaces. So there's the universal property, this full martingale convergence property that just says every martingale which is LP bounded on any probability space will converge almost everywhere to some limit. Sometimes it's useful to say, well, let's consider just this one space and ask for convergence of martingales on that space. I'm gonna give away the game just for a moment here. All these properties are equivalent for all P. If you have it for one P, you have it for all, but we're not gonna prove that directly. We're gonna prove that very indirectly. And before we prove that, we're gonna just investigate these properties as if they were inequivalent, not knowing that they're equivalent. How do all these P's interact with each other, right? Also, I'm gonna give away that this is equivalent to the radon nicotine property, just in advance. <laughs> That's one reason that this property, this Martingale convergence property, I invented that term. You won't see this term in the literature because people will just refer to the radon nicotine property. I should write that down. Radon nicotine property or RNP. It's equivalent to that, but we don't know that yet. You can also talk about the radon nicotine property with respect to a certain measure space, and it's exactly corresponds to this notion here. I mean, I would like to make it like a novel that has like a, a twist. Ah, uh, hey, it's equivalent to RNP, but that's not good pedagogy. You're supposed to give away the game at the beginning so that people know what they're working towards. We'll start with a simple proposition. If you have P greater than or equal to one and you have Q that's greater than P, then the P Martingale convergence property implies the Q Martingale convergence property. So you have a scale of seemingly stronger and seemingly weaker properties 
this is the strongest. This is the weakest. They are all equivalent, but if you don't know that yet, the first thing you can say is one is stronger than infinity. As the number, as P gets larger, the property gets weaker. Formally. So if the proof, the proof, you have to isolate the P equals one and P greater than one cases because they behave slightly differently. For P greater than one, this just follows from the fact that LQ is contained continuously in LP because we're on a probability space. So LQ boundedness, LQ bounded martingales are automatically LP bounded. And that's it. So if you have an LQ bounded martingale, it's LP bounded. Assuming the P martingale convergence property, you have a limit. And the fact that you have a limit doesn't depend on the choice of P. Nothing to do with P. For P equal one, we just have that complication of uniform integrability. <laughs> we need to show that every bounded subset F, which is contained in LQ, which we know is contained in L1, is uniformly integrable. Now you can use that um, theorem that uniform integrability is equivalent to weak relative compactness, and you can use that LQ is reflexive and deduce it from there. Or you can do a more direct proof using the definition of uniform integrability, which is a little bit nicer. For all F in the set, and for all A in the sigma algebra A, the integral of F, and remember we're trying to make this small when A is small, this is the definition of uniform integrability. Using Holder's inequality, this is bounded by the LQ norm of F times the probability of A to the power one on Q prime. This doesn't work if Q is infinity. <laughs> You, you want to have this probability of A term so that when the probability of A is sufficiently small, this right-hand side is less than epsilon. And if Q were one, one on Q prime would be, hang on, how does that work? If you were to use Hurler's inequality with Q equal one here, you would get no P of A term. You'd just get a one. <laughs> and you can't make that smaller by making A smaller. So let's just, be very formal with this proof for all epsilon greater than zero, take delta to be epsilon on the supremum of the LQ norms of F for F in the set, because the set's assumed to be bounded in LQ and take that to the power Q prime. Here's one I prepared earlier. <laughs> then if A has probability less than delta, if the integral of F is less than epsilon. You can do the arithmetic yourself. It checks out. So F is uniformly integrable. And what this all implies in the end is that LQ boundedness or LQ bounded martingales for Q greater than one are L1 bounded and uniformly integrable. So if you assume the one martingale convergence property, that martingale will have an almost everywhere limit. Good. So the one MCP implies the QMCP. That was simple. Any questions? No? So what this proves is that the scalar field, whether it's R or C, has the P martingale convergence property for all P between one and infinity. I mean, we knew before that it had this property for all P greater than or equal to one, but not infinity. We sort of ruled out infinity all the time in these theorems. For example, this theorem here, we ruled out P equals infinity. 
But if you have an L infinity bounded martingale, it's LP bounded for all P less than infinity. And it's got an almost everywhere limit from that. I'm just not claiming that you have convergence in L infinity. We don't need that. I think you've got it. We probably have that. I don't really know why I'm ruling out L infinity all the time. Go home and check that. Does this all work for P equals infinity? I honestly can't remember. And we don't really need to know that. So the scalar field has this property and that implies by standard basis techniques, if your Barnack space X is finite dimensional, X has the PMCP for all P. Great. Now, with when I wrote my notes, I thought that would take 45 minutes and it didn't. I've got eight minutes left to fill and I have no more notes. So are there any questions? <laughs> We can always finish early. Um, one one came to mind. It's it's yeah. not immediately related to that. It's something from before. That's um, right. So you mentioned this Banach convergence principle last lecture in this lecture yep. as well. But um, just typing that into Google, I couldn't really find anything. Oh, <laughs> then I might have called it the wrong <laughs> thing. Let me try Googling. Yeah. <laughs> Banach. So is it Google as well? Like it should be, but I might have called it slightly the wrong thing. Um, there's something called the Barnack principle that I immediately find. And maybe that's it. Some random paper I found on the Barnack principle. This is a obscure looking paper. We extend the Barnack principle to sequences of operators which have as range an Archimedean Reef space. I don't know what that is. The role played in the classical Barnack principle by the almost everywhere convergence. Yeah, I think it's just called the Barnack principle. All right. And there's a reference here, and I'll just quickly follow that reference and see what it is. The Barnack principle is listed in reference three of this paper, which is Barnack sur la convergence presque partout des fonctionnelles linéaires, which seems to be in French <laughs> from 1926. Um, I think it's called the Barnack principle. You will find it if. You, Okay, if I want to give a hint for proving this exercise, instead of looking up the Barnack principle, look at the proof of the um, Lebesgue differentiation theorem, which uses the boundedness of the Hardy Littlewood maximal function to deduce the, the differentiation theorem. And it's the same principle as that. But, yeah, okay, that's in the book, right? The, the four or the one. Should be. I think I saw it. Yeah, okay, yeah. that's good. Thank you. Or you can look <laughs> even in Pizier's book. I think the proof of this results in the. I just didn't yeah, want to type it, it out. <laughs> if, you, if, if you don't have a ref, if you can't find it in the book, um, a good reference is uh, Princeton Lectures of Analysis, um, the third book in the series. Yeah. So, yeah. Everything's in Stein Shikachi. What's the third book? The Measure Theory one? Uh, yeah, the Measure Theory one. Yeah, that's a great book. I learned it a lot goes of Measure Theory in that book. I did as well. It goes yeah, into good. great gory detail if yeah. you need it. Maybe also book four, the newest one, functional yeah. analysis. Yes. That's also got a lot of good yes. stuff in it. Yeah, it does. Just on Einstein, no worries. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Homework for you, all of you is to go and legally obtain um, all four <laughs> volumes of Stein and Shikachi. Actually, they're not even too expensive. You could actually legally obtain them. And I, I, I have them sitting on my desk. So. Good, perfect. I have yeah. an um, international edition of volume four which is legal, uh -huh. but I don't think it's allowed to be sold outside of Singapore <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, go get that. It's, it's great. I mean, you could just go and read those books and ignore my lectures. They're much better. 